Welcome to Legacy Therapy, the podcast that will teach you, in bite-sized chunks, how to leave a stress-free legacy so loved ones can focus on people, not paperwork, when you become ill or pass away. Here is your host and financial advocate, Stacy golden Lisnock. Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of Legacy Therapy, Planning Techniques for a Stress-Free Legacy. This is Stacey Golden-Lisnock, your financial advocate, bringing you another episode where we're going to learn lots of tips and tricks so that you can leave yourself, your family, a stress-free legacy. Today, I'm very excited to bring uh, to the table here, uh, William Decker. And Bill says that growing up, his grandfather was the biggest influence in his life. He took me to the Yankee Stadium, taught me about coin collecting, the value of money and hard work. When the phone call came that he had passed, I knew my life would change. It did in ways I had never expected. Even though he had made a will, his estate went through probate. Dealing with those challenges and seeing it again years later with more family members is the catalyst for why I came to this business and how I serve my clients today. Bill is an insurance agent with New York Life Insurance Company and various other independent unaffiliated insurance companies. He's also a registered representative and offers securities products and services through New York Life Securities, LLC. So welcome, Bill. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the show and hear all about your story of how you got involved. And um, I know it's a really good one. So go ahead. Hey, thanks, Stacey. Thanks for having me on today. You're welcome. Yeah, you know, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit uh, with my story uh, firsthand. When my, my grandfather, uh, when he did pass, like I said, he, he had a will. And at that time, it was about, it was about 30 years ago. Even though he had a will, uh, his estate still had to go through probate. And my mother had to go borrow money to pay the taxes before the estate could be settled. Wow. And she was a single mom and she actually went to the bank that was holding most of my grandfather's money and they denied her for a loan. Oh my. Wow. Well, she had to go literally to two other banks before she could get a loan to pay the taxes on the estate and, and, and get it settled. And I said, you know, she was a single mom and watching that for the first time, I, I, it was a real a wake up lesson uh, to estate planning and, and how that worked. And then a few years later, uh, I went through that again with another family member and watched them. They just passed at uh, age 66 and got, you know, retirement age. And they had taken a large uh, settlement package from their company, early retirement package, and really never read, read the fine details and didn't realize how much of that was going to change when they actually turned 65. Uh, the biggest changes was some of the reduction in their life insurance policies mm -hmm. they were employee paid for. And the second was what changes with healthcare at age 65. And, and watching that again and seeing the results of that, I actually, uh, you know, my stepmom uh, wasn't able to keep the house that she had, you know, and I think there was some life insurance that was expected and that, that, that didn't really come to fruition because those benefits had come down. That was the catalyst for really getting me into this industry, starting to work with people because so many people have a perception or an idea of what's going to happen. And usually the reality is much different. That's what I find too. I, I'm so shocked and I'm sure they are too, to find that what they always thought to be true is as a figment of their imagination. Like they almost like make it up as they go along because really when you think about it who spends time really going back through their paperwork and looking at it ever right you get like your employee benefits as an example you get your packet you sign up for stuff and then you put it in a drawer you don't even know what you have just don't know it's so true mm -hmm. it is this you're doing great work with this and and, and bringing this uh, as a forum of bringing this conversation to the forefront it is really important because you what you say the perception of what people have and the reality of what they have is it just too many times is different. Absolutely. 
So you like you like uh, talking about this stretch IRA and, and what's going on in that industry, because that's a huge one. Most people have the majority, besides their real estate, I would say that would be the next largest piece of uh, asset that somebody leaves behind. Is that not true? Is that? Yeah, I think uh, that's probably true. Uh, for people, that's probably one of the most common vehicles that people are using for you know retirement and living on that. Uh, and like you said, last year, after the SECURE Act passed, the, the stretch IRA really uh, had an impact. What, what that was before that, rule, that law changed was you could inherit an IRA from a non-spouse person. And if they were upset the age of 70 and a half, you had to take out those required minimum distributions, or they're called RMDs, mm -hmm. but you could take them out on your age. So it was much less. So they recalculate it based on your, because you could be like 45 years old and then it would go for your life expectancy exactly. and you stretching it over your, like a much younger person's life. And therefore they're not getting dinged as much because all of it's taxable. So sometimes people don't realize when they inherit money, um, it comes with a tax bill, certain, certain assets, some assets you get a jump up in basis, right? So you get relieved of big capital gains, but not so much with your uh, retirement, if it's not a, a Roth, right? So you can tell, talk about I that. Mean, one. Really, you know, legally, there's really two ways of going about this. It's using a Roth, mm -hmm. you know, finding creative ways of using a Roth, or using life insurance. Right. You know, those are really the two ways to to bypass taxes or help pay for those ta those tax liabilities. Right. Help pay for it. So I, and it's a huge point because I've uh, I've been an insurance agent for a lot of years too, and I think what happens sometimes. I've had people come into some money, usually it's an inheritance, and then they cancel their life insurance. And they're just like, I don't need it anymore. I've got plenty of money, I'm good. Or they get a business windfall, something happens really good with their business and they're, I don't need it. And they don't realize that the wealthiest people in the world, like they're new to this, what they think is wealth. The wealthiest people in the world have the most life insurance because it's a tool to offset the fact that you're wealthy and you have these other, expenses. And a lot of times the wealthiest people have their money tied up in investments and real estate and things. So no, that, that's, it's a great point. Um, there's a lot people have, a, I think there's a perception of what life insurance is. And for most people, I pay a premium. And when I pass, or, you know, walk away from this life, someone's going to get a big check. And there's so much inside of life insurance, if you're working creatively, that you can do tax benefit wise, cash flow wise for retirement. Um, yeah. It's a whole nother, we could get the whole nother segment we could get into. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to get off that topic today too deep into that. Right, right. So I, I think I probably got you off track too. It was like the stretch IRA is now the rules have changed. And so it's not so good for the person it, inheriting that money now. So what's, how so? Well, basically that once you inherit that, you have a 10 year window now. Um, where you, you have to do something with that money. So you're not going to be able to stretch out the, if it's, let's just say it's an IRA, traditional IRA, mm -hmm. 401k, mm -hmm. any kind of deferred savings plan. You actually have 10 years to, to do something with that money. If you don't, after 10 years, there's a 50% penalty, which is high. Yeah. So you've got to make some decisions that the government wants the, the taxes paid on that money. Right. Um, even a Roth IRA, uh, the beautiful thing about a Roth IRA is you're not paying the taxes on it. However, you still have to come up with a distribution plan inside of that 10 year window. So the taxes aren't done, but you have to do something with that and rearrange that. Oh. That kind of really brings that back to that point because, uh, you know, for years, the stretch IRA was a great thing. You know, you sit down with somebody who's doing estate planning and say legacy. Okay, well, let's even, you know, I can put my grandchild on this. Mm -hmm. age, and mm -hmm. his cost basis is even going to be less on his tax rate because they're going to stretch out his life, you know, lifetime. Right. So that's kind of going away. So that, that, that idea of being able to use that has vanished. So now it's a 10 year window that we have to do something with this. Yeah, so just to give just to give the listeners a little bit of perspective on that. So if somebody has saved well um, and you're you're like the only child or let's say and they have maybe they have a half a million dollars saved and that's going to continue to grow over that 10 years. But you have over the 10 years have to take it out. Do you have to take it out evenly or you just have to have it all out by the 10 years? 
You actually have to have it all out over the 10 years. Okay. So if you did do it evenly and assuming it grew 0%, um, you're looking at an additional like $50,000 a year income. Yeah. At a half a million dollars, exactly what you're looking at. So that's either going to put you into a different tax bracket you know, and and maybe be, maybe some benefits that you that you're allowed to have now it would throw you over and make you ineligible. There's certain things that are based on your household income, right? That that would no longer be available for you. Yep. So you, they're looking at your tax basis that year. So let's just let's go back to your example. You know, I, I inherited five hundred thousand, and so if I'm in, if I'm a married couple, and we're in you know the twenty two percent tax bracket, we we can go up to about uh, let's just say roughly $169,000. So I could, you know, take a portion of that up to what I recommend is taking a portion of that or taking a look at I'm not making any recommendations here. These are just ideas. Yeah, sure. But, uh, we just take a, say, here's an example. Let me withdraw up to my maximum amount in my current tax bracket for that right. year, pay the taxes on that and have it taken care of and then find a way to uh, put it in to something that's going to grow. Hope, I prefer looking at tax-free options first, you know, tax-free withdrawals. Um, even on a situation like that, if, you, if, you, if you're working, you can open up your Roth. You can do conversions, Roth conversions. You don't have the income limitations on that. You can convert into a Roth qualified money. Hmm. The other idea is, you know, um, for certain people, uh, it may be worth taking a look at overfunding certain types of life insurance policies because you can also grow those. Um, you're looking, you know, lowest death benefit really, just maximizing the contributions that you put in there, maybe mm -hmm. over that 10 year period, and then just stop paying on the life insurance product. Don't pay for the whole time. And if you have a nice horizon, you know, maybe more than five years or 10 years longer, there's some really amazing things that can happen letting that money grow inside of that policy. And then later, during, depending on where you are looking at for retirement income or ways of supplementing your retirement income, those withdrawals will actually can be also come out tax free when it's put together properly just as the withdrawals on a Roth would be. Right. So those are two ideas of taking a look at saying, I'm gonna have this here or bringing that attention, you know, for when you're doing legacy planning. Right. I think today, and I, I'm, this is something I'm real passionate about right now and having these conversations is the tax rates. Uh, is it the tax rates on, on just current tax rates or, or on death tax, like a state tax well I, I think our current tax rates and even inherit if you're inheriting this now you know with the with this 10-year rule okay I've, I've got to make a decision i've got to make this money has to move somewhere in the next 10 years and there's one other question about that though do they have a certain time that they have to move the money to qualify that or there's penalties again like is it so long after the death of the person because i know people sometimes they just they're hesitant to do anything and they just let time and time go by. Is there a certain time frame? I know with COVID, they've kind of extended everything. It's all messed up. But what is there a time frame that you have to actually start taking the money? It's the tax year that the person passed and you've got 10 years in, into the future for that. You have to start taking it the year they died? No, your, 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 your clock starts. So you don't have to start taking it, but you have to do something with that. You have a 10 year window. There's, there's no minimums okay. to start, but the clock starts ticking actually. Okay, on the date of death, that's the date. Yeah, the date, the year okay. of the death. Okay, cool. Exactly. So, you know, a lot of this, when you're inheriting this, or you're leaving this for somebody, your beneficiaries that you're leaving this to, they're inheriting that tax bill also. And it's going to, you know, depending on what their career is and you know how they are earning their money today, that could have a, a big impact on the amount of taxes that they have. And I love just talking about and helping people understand where we are on income tax rates today. Right. I know when you're paying taxes, it's expensive. And it doesn't seem like they're that low. Right. But if we look at where we are historically in our country's history, we are at near all time federal tax rates being as low as the most they've ever been. 
especially, I mean, there was a lot of warning signs of, you know, going to have to raise taxes in the future anyway, with different spending and the deficit and, you know, future projections for Medicare and Social Security and all that. That's, that's kind of been baked into the, the equation here for several years. Uh, with COVID this year and the amount of federal spending that's taken place, and that's even as this is being recorded today, mm-hmm. you know, there's conversations going on in Washington right now of more money being spent. And this is money that's being spent that the reality is it's being borrowed. Okay, it's not on anybody's ledge. Right. They're borrowing that. What does that mean for everybody? And why is that important? The impact that that's going to have on future tax rates. I mean, we're just, our deficit total has grown in a, this year alone 10%, just with this extra spending. And we're talking about doing more. Um, not to be political in any way at all. I don't care what party you are. The mathematics don't work out. Taxes are going to have to come from somewhere. Right. And that's just the reality that we're looking at. And so when I'm thinking about that and, and coming into the you know, legacy planning, it's like that tax bill is being passed on to somebody. And mm-hmm. I think the longer we wait and not address that, the larger those tax bills are going to be in the future. Yeah. So, so that's I, you know, I'm I, really passionate about sharing today. Yeah. And I mean, when you talk about um, the retirement red zone, what, what, does that, what does that mean exactly? So the, the retirement red zone, think about your uh, coming into retirement, mm-hmm. whatever your retirement date is, really the five years prior to that retirement date and the five years after. That's a very important time for people. Uh, it's a lot of transitions are taking place. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, company benefits. You know, if you've worked for a company, um, you know, your, your benefit plans, your health insurance, you know, disability insurance, all those type of things have been handled through your, your HR department. Now you're moving into retirement, you're going to be looking at Medicare, okay, which is completely different than the way under 65 healthcare works. Mm-hmm. Uh, disability insurance, you're not really worried about that, but you might be concerned about long-term care and, and looking at that. How and when do you want to claim Social Security? There's, there's so many things involved in claiming Social Security. What time? Are you married? Are you single? Okay. You know, the impact of when you claim Social Security is going to impact your spouse, depending on which one walks away from life earlier. So that's going to have an impact. So that's a question to look at. And I think when it comes to your, your savings plans, the way you've spent 30, 40 years accumulating, you know, and some of the rules that made you successful in accumulating that money, Mm -hmm. those rules are just, they're not going to work as effectively when you're in the distribution phase of life and and looking at that. Um, One of the biggest things is just taking a look at, I think, how volatile is my portfolio? You know, if I'm risking and growing as I get closer to retirement, do I really want to have an impact of, you know, what happened this year in March or another 2008 or a 2000, you know, where it's mm-hmm. like, if I'm getting ready to retire that five-year period, okay, and we have a repeat of 2008, do I have the next three years to let, let that to recover just to get back to even? So that's kind of that mindset change. And then with the money being distributed, the distribution phase, you're not replacing that money. So that's a little bit different. You look at earnings differently. Obviously, you're looking at taxes differently. And I think you maybe start looking at fees that you're paying differently. So there's a whole bunch of transitional. Yeah. So in in overall, your strategy has to change. So you can't have the same mindset. You're not you're not 35 anymore and you're not 45 anymore. You're not even 55 anymore. So you've got a whole different set. It's kind of like being a grandparent versus being a parent which I can, I can attest to that. It's a little different, right? You got the kid and then you get to send them home. I don't have to deal with everything. But when, on the retirement thing, you know, you've got a, a whole different thing. You're trying to grow your money and trying to like squirrel it away <clears throat> as much as possible. And then it becomes where you're starting to take it out. And sometimes people don't want to use it. So what, speak to that. Do people sometimes just they, they really even resist taking their RMDs. And I don't think they realize um, what the penalties are on that because people just don't know about what they don't, what they don't know. 
Yeah, well, one of the good things is RMDs now have been kicked down the road a little bit. So you don't used to be 70 and a half is when you had to start taking those. Mm -hmm. RMDs is required minimum distribution. Mm -hmm. I, I just refer to that as when you've been saving your money for all these years, tax deferred. Right. And now Uncle Sam comes and knocking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to pay that tax bill. Right. So that's what those required minimum distributions are. Typically, if they that you take a the totality of all your deferred accounts, and roughly you're gonna, it's about four percent of that total is what has to start coming out on an annual basis. And that adjusts a little bit every year as, as you move up the age ladder. Yeah. That's basically how RMDs work. So I I'm a big proponent of looking at those as quickly as possible, you know, and saying, okay. What, what, what is, number one, what's my purpose for this money? Okay, is this money to live on? Is this money to, you know, for the grandchildren? Is it, you know, for our second home? Well, I don't know. Everybody's got a different scenario for that. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to identify those pieces first. And then from that, look at how, you know, you're going to look at that. Like, let's just say for an example, I'm going to, I'm going to use the 4% withdrawal rule which is a common um, philosophy for taking out, withdrawing down, you know, spending 4% of my portfolio. Right. Um, it may work for you, it may not, but it's, 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 a common, it's a common conversation. If you're looking at that today and saying, okay, here, I've got, you know, I, I'm doing that now, then my RMDs are gonna come into that. Well, let's just say taxes go up from the 22%, let's say they go up to 35%. Now, my budget's totally changed because I've got 15% of what I was thinking of withdrawing now has totally vanished because now Uncle Sam has taken that away. Mm -hmm. So it does impact you what your plans are for that money, especially if you're planning on living on it. You've got to put that, and I, you've got to have some kind of plan or at least address that and not let it just sneak up on you. Absolutely. What do, what do you know about um, people that leave their employers and never take the 401k with, and then, you know, they forget about it or somebody, or they die and nobody else knows about it. I mean, what, what does that happen a lot? Um, it does. It, it does happen a lot. I mm -hmm. think one of, I, to not, it's really thinking about that. It's so common mm -hmm. today to have multiple accounts. Right. You know? And, uh, Here's the thing about it: uh, 401ks are a great way to get a savings plan going. But if you do, if you uh, if you have left your company, if you're listening to this today, please go pull those accounts out. Okay, talk to your advisor, your financial advisor, and find a way to probably roll it into another properly tax qualified plan. I say that number one is you're you're probably paying way more fees than you need to be. Mm -hmm. um, 401ks are expensive to administer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that money that you can, you know, wherever you decide to, most of the time it's going to save you a lot, but just keeping it, the fees that you're paying is, is hurting your potential earnings. Right. That's, that's usually number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I mean, there's a couple uh, websites or uh, that people could go into and, and, and look for, you know, lost money. If you had a relative, you know, long lost relative and something like that. But right. most of the time, right. um, well, this got, you know, really goes back to your, your, your planning and your, your kit that you're talking about with people is, you know, put these, these accounts need to be in a place that people are going to learn about them and, and keep them okay. in the, not so much in the forefront, really, but just let me people know and be aware of them. Right. I just had a friend that um, his wife had passed away and he's now come across two different investments that he didn't know about that he's found out about like totally by accident. And so even though she knew she was sick and things weren't going well, she didn't mention them. And I think that when you're in a critical, when you're in a health crisis like that, you're not going to remember uh, something that you left at an employer 20 years ago that's, that's there as a benefit for your spouse. You're just not going to think of it. So when, um, and the, the program that I have going is called Got It Together Emergency Info File. So we touch on every single one of those accounts and, and at least log them and discuss them with the person that needs to know so that it's not left in the background. And you're right, if they if it's with a company for longer than um, a certain number of years and they can't get a hold of you, um, 
they will send it to the state and then you have to jump through 50 more hoops to get it out of the state. It's a really long, tedious process, especially if somebody has passed away. It's hard enough if you're still alive to get your unclaimed funds uh, because I've had to do it personally. A couple of things um, slipped through the cracks and went there on my behalf. And they're from places that pay me on a regular basis. I just still don't understand how it got there. They're paying me every single week or every month already. And then they send this little check to the state <laughs> saying that they couldn't find me. It's like nothing's changed. Phone numbers, not the change, nothing's changed and they can't find me. So I would just say, you know, when we talk about that unclaimed funds, check, just go in and check as a, as a fun thing to do. You might find some money there. Just saying. <laughs> No, exactly. Mm -hmm. Stacey, I think that's really one of the things that you do that's that, that's so important for people, okay? It's to have those conversations, you know? Um, you know, hopefully, if you have a planner or an advisor that you're working with, you're having that conversation, you know, if not on an annual basis, at least every other year, right? updating beneficiaries. Um, you know, another, here's a another common situation um you know second families um divorced yes. <laughs> changing beneficiaries yes. <laughs> make, yes making you know coming through on there other accounts that you know through maybe divorce settlements or something like that taking a look at where those those get placed so i think bringing that to the forefront and having those conversations is just so important because we're, we're so busy all right yeah. and a lot of times i think this is a conversation that people are having it's uncomfortable number one yeah. to get started. It's very uncomfortable. And some people get angry if you bring it up. So you've got, you've got to kind of pick your spots. Exactly. And um, so, uh, yeah. So in the, in the course that, that I've got too, it's like, it's like how to start the conversation. And maybe sometimes you need a third party to start the, the conversation, um, especially with older people too. They're, they're so um, tight uh, on, on telling anybody what they have. They just are not, they never did it. Their parents never did it. They just keep it real close to the vest, as they say. And so, um, you know, they're, they're, no one's the wiser. You know, those people that die with their own millions of dollars, but they live like paupers, you know, you would never know it. So they keep it real under, <laughs> under perhaps. I don't it's know why. <laughs> it's like, you don't talk about money, politics, and religion, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. So uh, interesting, yeah. So I um, I understand you've got a book coming out. You want to talk about that? I do actually. Uh, coming out in November. Uh, it's entitled "Navigating the Retirement Red Zone," and it really just kind of talks about that that five year period that we were talking about earlier. The 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 transition of your thought process from you know accumulation into the distribution phase of planning, and it just it's really different. And it's, that's the area of like planning that I really specialize in and looking at that, um, you know, it's fascinating. It's a, it's a changing dynamic, you know, going into there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the topics, you know, we kind of touched on a little bit earlier, but it's like, you know, taking a look at your social security claiming strategy. I think that's really important. That's very important. Yes. Especially for married couples, because I don't think people realize is that, uh, you know, once you understand what your social security benefits going to be, Mm -hmm. then, you know, if something happens to one of those spouses, what happens is the largest check stays in place and the smallest check goes away. Right. And people, oh, that's not, a lot of times they, didn't, don't, they don't realize that. Right. Um, this is another uh, little, little, little tidbit, I think, for um, any, any, any divorced people out there. If you did not remarry and you were married for 10 years or more, you may be entitled to your spouse's social security to take your a look at it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your, your ex-spouse, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if they were maybe a better earner or had a better, you know, That's earning right. years for you, it really might be worth checking that into that, and getting an understanding. You will, you know, social security office will get you that information if you have your marriage certificate and your divorce papers, they'll share that information with you, but it comes into your social security strategy, you know, because maybe you can utilize some of those benefits before you actually turn on your, so those are some of the topics that we try to talk about in the book. Um, we touch on Medicare, you know, a little bit, a little bit trying to make that simple, 
long-term care. And then the last part is really the distribution in taxes, you know, moving tax strategies, okay? Not to pay more than you need to. I'm not, right. not advocating not paying your taxes, just don't pay more than what you need to. And really coming into the other three risks that I see is the longevity, making sure your money lasts as long as your retirement is. The uh, sequence of returns, which makes no difference to you when you're working and accumulating, but as soon as you start taking distributions out of those accounts that are still tied to the market, market conditions yeah. are, the risk are multiplied when you start withdrawing money out of there. And then withdrawal rate. You know, we, we touched on that a little bit about, you know, just using in general, the 4% rule. Right. Um, that's going to be different for everybody. You know, a lot, a lot of people are saying, you know, in order to have a 30, 40 year retirement, that's kind of high. And we look at going into what other options would may be available, you know, that could be utilizing, you know, again, making no recommendations here, but just looking at and exploring options of what cash value life insurance can do or annuities can do or rebalancing a portfolio that's not so um, emphasized on stocks and more emphasized on, on, on bonds and, and dividend paying stocks and not so much, you know, growth and risk and, and looking at those areas to make sure that your income or your, right. your savings is going to last right. for your whole retirement and not have real impact on your, on yeah. your retirement income. It's almost like you have to do a, a whole remodel because you're now you're at a whole different phase of life and everything has changed. You're not, you're not a bit, you're not a uh, new married starting a family where you're accumulating and, 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 you know, you need the big house and you need, you got to need all this stuff, right? Now you're at a whole nother level, a whole different, you're just in a whole nother, you have a whole nother menu of things that you have to be concerned about and you don't know about them because you've never been there yet. And so the problem though, that I see is that people at that stage in life are tired. They didn't really understand it earlier. And they're definitely not like of interested um, or have the patience or the desire more like um, to learn all this stuff. So, I mean, that's even more reason to get a professional that loves working with seniors because seniors are, you know, they have a lot of things that they need to be dis discussed and they need to understand it to at least a degree where they can make a decision and not just make no decision because that is a decision. <laughs> it's a decision for disaster. Yep. And, and that's what I'm finding that's happened is because, and, and I'm even finding it with myself and I kind of shocked because I was always, I can do anything attitude. If as a five-year-old, I was like, oh, I could do it. You know, anything anybody said I couldn't do that was motivation to do it. But I'm finding that I'm getting a little lazy in that like certain thing, new things I don't want to have to learn like these tech, certain technology things. Even though I'm learning it, I'm begrudgingly learning it and keep saying, why am I doing this? Um, and I've been in the financial arena for 33 years. So what about the people that have never been interested in it? And it's such a huge part of the next phase of the life that if they do ignore it, they will suffer the consequences of it. And, and it's almost like they're not going to know until they're too deep into it and they can't make the repair. One of them being, if you don't get your Medicare, right, you don't sign up for it in time, then there's these penalties that just, and this yeah. one thing that goes on for the rest of your life, like you can't get out of it. I guess with COVID, there's one little window because of COVID that they're going to, they're going to forgive. Um, it's something to do with, what is it the, the prescription? Something to do with something. If you don't sign up for it, then you get penalized the rest of your life and you never can get in it. And yeah, there's, there's two that people need to pay attention to uh, if you're coming into Medicare. It's, it's when you activate your Part B. Okay. At, at 65, um, your Part A portion of Medicare automatically you qualify for if, you've, you know, if you're a citizen and have your, your, work, your years of service. Um, part B is what you have to start paying for. So that you have to tell, well, you go through the Social Security Administration to activate your Medicare you allowed to let them know I'm going to start paying yeah. for Part B. Yeah. If you don't have your credible insurance coverage in a, over a six month period, then you start call a penalty kicks in for there, and then vice versa. The same thing with uh, prescription drug plans. If you don't mm -hmm. have it, once you lose your employer coverage or you just didn't have coverage, right. and you turn 65 and say, "Well, I'm healthy. I don't need that. Why do I want to pay the premium? I don't go to the doctor." Right. You know, and then eight years later, now you're 73 and you're like, oh, I need to go to the doctor. And it's like, well, 
they look at the clock and it's well, it's been eight years. <laughs> so now you're paying a penalty on top of not doing that. So um, yeah. just yeah, just just pay attention to that. It's yeah. you know. Yeah, it, there's certain dates, ages, or certain times that you have to actually take action and um, and not procrastinate. And I and I do have to say that the the whole there's a whole community out there that's really helping seniors and they're really appealing to them, but it's almost to such a, a high level that it's almost feels like you're being you're being um, sold something like you're being um, solicited right so um a lot of people just turn off they don't want to hear it don't talk to me i don't want to be sold something um but yes. they're trying to help you to get these things in place that have to get in place and what are they going to do i mean you got to know they're available great great point stacy um it is a true, that's a very true statement of what you're talking about. Um, there's a, there's a high cap is a, something that people can go and look up. Uh, they're kind of a, a nonprofit organization that'll help people explore Medicare options. Um, I'm actually going to be releasing a course here in November off of uh, navigating the retirement red zone website. That will be uh, a course on just explaining the transition into Medicare, what to look at for, you know, if you want to go the med sup way or the hmo way and it's not there's no pitch there there's no there's nothing to buy there's no phone call from an agent right you want to pursue that after the fact and you know, after you go through the course that's completely up to you and at that but there's no oh here click on this next window and the agent's going to call you right it's just an educational site on there right and kind of try and tying that into the book because it is something that uh you know there's over ten thousand people a day that are uh -huh. turning 65 right now. Yeah, that's what I heard. It's an amazing statistic. Okay. 10,000 people a day. That's crazy. Well, look, I think we're out of time, but um, do you have something you wanted to offer um, to the listeners? Yes. So look, uh, the book is coming out November 15th, um, but uh, for listening today and, and, and having me on here, I'd like to offer you a free copy. So if you want to email me at wdecker, that's W-D-E-C-K-E-R, at ftfranktom.newyorklife.com. Just send me an email there and I will send you out, give you your uh, address and I will send you out a hard copy of the book. No charge. Well, that's very generous. Thank you. So it was ft. Dot. I don't think I had that dot in here. I had, I want to put it in the show notes as well. So repeat that email again. It's W Decker. Mm -hmm at ft.newyorklife.com. Okay, I will put that in the show notes. Great. All right, well, I just, uh, it's, been a, it's been great. We could probably talk all day long, which is why I wanted you on here. There's so many topics and we've kind of jumped around a little bit, I, I know. But hopefully people have followed what we're talking about, but they could reach out to you. Uh, I guess they could email you. Do you want to give a phone number too? Sure, uh, you can call me directly, 951-970. 4445 or just send me an email and we can have a conversation about anything that we talked about. And Stacy, I just really want to say thank you for having me on here today. I think the work that you're doing and the programs that you're putting together, it's, it's just so important. It's a, um, you're coming from this from the right place. You're educating people because again, we mentioned it earlier, it's an uncomfortable topic, but the results of not having a plan in place impact not only you but the people that you love okay and i've been through it twice now with the close family members so yeah if, you know, probate isn't something that you want it's not like a weekend vacation or anything it is it is not it, it really isn't yeah. and uh, you know just understanding these things and, and, and taking advice i know um you know it's hard who do i trust and go through that talk to a couple of people but start getting the information today and 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 doing that you'll you'll be happy you did yeah yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate having you on. And I just want to mention to the to the listeners too that uh, the course got it together emergency info file. Uh, by the time this airs should be actually out. But uh, right now, as we're speaking, there is a wait list on the website for it. So it's um, got it together now .com. And um, the in the inf the uh, got it together information emergency info file is really designed for this if you should get sick or you should uh, have an accident, or you should pass away like today, where's all your stuff? 
That's what we're looking at. We're looking at where's all your stuff and making sure that you have the right beneficiaries because we have some stories there about the wrong people getting, getting your stuff. Uh, and then uh, making sure that, um, that everything is in place and that the person that needs to know knows how to get to everything, your passwords and all of that jazz. Um, so it isn't, it isn't just for the older people, anybody that's alive, that's an adult should be concerned about this. And um, so we're making it very available, very affordable and everybody I believe should do it. So we make it, I don't say we make it fun. We make it as fun as this topic can be. And uh, you get, you get that good, the good old boy feeling <laughs> about I'm doing something that's going to, my family's going to get appreciate that I'm doing. So got it together. Um, got it together now.com go on the website and sign on there and uh, we'll look forward to it. So want to sign off for today. Um, thank you for listening. And this is Stacy Golden Lisnock, your financial advocate, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Legacy Therapy Podcast. If we hit it out of the park today and you learned at least one new thing to take action on in your own quest to planning the best legacy possible, then be sure to tell your friends, subscribe, and rate and review wherever you get your podcast. The show notes will provide the sites and information that were discussed today. You can get more great tips, resources, and inspiration by visiting our website, legacytherapypodcast.com. Dot com.